Welcome, welcome. This is the Enlightenment Show, and I'm your host, Laurie Schoenfeld. This is where Chicken Soup for the Soul meets the artist way with Nancy Drew. Our guest today is Amy Turner, author of On the Ledge. We're going to be chatting with her today all about her new release and how her brush of death led to her healing her own childhood trauma. Welcome, welcome, Amy. Oh, it's so nice to be here, Lori. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. What is something that you are passionate passionate about within your life right now? Well, I have been very passionate about writing. And, you know, I think what I'm most passionate about this very second, this kind of week when my book launched and everyone's reading it, is I am just simply overwhelmed with gratitude. And I just, that that's just my uh, feeling that seems to be coloring everything that's happening. So I feel very passionate about that and about my family because of course the memoir is about, um, has a lot to do with my parents and so forth. And so I just feel surrounded by them. And, um, and then I'm passionate about my dog and hoping that he get over his lamp so he can go run around in the yard. <laughs> uh, that's, that's what I'm passionate about right now. And I hope to get back to writing once everything kind of settles down. Mm -hmm. It's always sad when a dog can't run around the yard because that's like their joyful thing to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you share with our listeners and viewers, Amy, what On the Ledge is all about? Sure. Well, back in 2010, I was crossing the street in a pickup uh, in a crosswalk with a sign, stop for pedestrians, and a pickup truck mowed me down and dragged me 20 feet. I wasn't quite aware of that at the time. And I in the, unfortunately, I didn't have any internal injuries or broken bones, but of course there was a recovery period. I did have concussion and all, all other kinds of problems. And to my great surprise and gratitude, in the course of recovering from that, I found myself healing from a trauma that was buried much deeper. And that when I was four and a half, my father climbed out on the ledge of his hotel window and threatened to jump. He was then hospitalized for close to a year. My mother at the time was an active alcoholic with four young children. And I didn't learn about this until I was 16. And so the book is really about how I end up coming to terms with that initial childhood trauma and to sort of make a full circle. In a sense, it was in having to confront the vulnerability I felt facing the windshield because I was directly looking into the windshield, but it was shaded. I figured he could see me. So in confronting sort of the vulnerability I felt then, the trauma brought me back to this level of vulnerability I felt as a four and a half year old, that though I'd had you know, years and years of therapy, I'd never, released or experienced in my nervous system. And, uh, and that led to really a profound healing mm -hmm. as a result of the accident. How did your perspective on life change immediately after the accident? What were some of the things that shifted within you? Well, initially, right after the accident, I kind of doubled down on my lifetime pattern, which was to say, I'm not weak, nothing's wrong with me, I'm not sick, because I had this fear, you know, of being sick or mentally ill or an alcoholic, like my parents, so I could never admit any kind of weakness or vulnerability. So I just dismissed it. I had I had turned the accident into basically a stand-up routine. I could get people laughing their heads off about it. Um, and Finally, it took a really long time for me to uh, really face that accident. So initially I was, I was um, 
distracting myself from it, avoiding it. My brother dies a, uh, a month after the accident, which also a random shocking event. And I, as much as I tried to avoid it, I couldn't shake the feeling that my life was just so out of my control, these two random events. And I was so unsettled. And I think ultimately it took a while, but there was some deep, deep need to integrate these events into my life to somehow see, do they somehow fit into this life? I couldn't leave them out there as these you know, bizarre outlier um, events. So eventually I really did feel this shift of being able to acknowledge that I was weak, that I was vulnerable. And then once you do that, you actually feel safer and more protected because nothing then can really uh, harm you in a very deep way that you can't recover from. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What heightened your anxiety with the accident? You had PTSD and anxiety before the accident, mm -hmm. but how did it in that moment heighten you even that much more to gain those awarenesses? Well, you know, in the moment of the accident, when the, the I, I thought the truck was going to stop because here we are, you know, he's about 10 feet, six feet from me and I think, oh, he's going to stop. Mm -hmm. And then he accelerates. And I realized in that moment, I, this is it. And in retrospect, uh, I'm getting a, you know, a chill as I say this, I realized that in retrospect, of course, I, I realized in retrospect, I realized that at that moment, I totally let go. And there was this sense of overwhelming relief that I didn't have to be afraid anymore which, I mean, I have two children, a husband. I honestly cannot believe that there was a sense of relief that I don't have to worry anymore. I don't have to carry this burden. Mm -hmm. And um, that was shocking for me to realize that it, it was just so deep, this carrying this burden of anxiety that it started really with my father, the worry that he would try to jump again or go into some deep depression or there, my mother might drink. And it was, it, it had, I knew I carried it as a burden. I just didn't know how absolutely deep it was that facing my death, I was actually feeling relief and giving it up. So, um, you know, and looking at the truck uh, and then going back also thinking about the the uh, aspect of the anxiety afterwards, it was very hard for me to go back and think about, to really go back to the accident and say exactly what happened because the, I was flooded with anxiety thinking about it, re reliving it. Mm -hmm. There are so many parts within your book, Amy, of just like looking at your ankles and having those marks on your ankles of like re-remembering you know, those scars and those marks that we carry. Yes. Sometimes that we forget that we have, but we continue to carry on through on our lives. Yes. What kind of marks did you start recognizing that you had from your childhood? Well, I would say uh, the, the strongest mark, you know, figure, figuratively was that I was constantly you know, hyper aware, hyper vigilant, always looking for signs. Maybe I was always looking for marks in other people, you know, are, are my father's eyes glazing over or sort of deeper in his socket? Is my mother that much more anxious and, and tense? Is there some vibration in the house that sort of feels mm -hmm. scary? Is something going to happen? So I was constantly looking for signs so that I could anticipate what was gonna happen. And which is so unfortunate for a child and as a parent, I'm sure I did it for mine. When 
children aren't told what's going on. They think they're either responsible or they can fix it. So I was constantly looking, you know, can I fix this? Is this going to happen? Maybe if I change my behavior. So I think I was looking in for marks in other people. And as far as the tire marks on my feet, I think that for me is just, my gosh, how lucky, how lucky I was. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through, Amy, um, of that moment when you felt that your head was just in a lot of pain, but you couldn't move. And so those feelings and thoughts of what you thought was occurring in that moment. Yes. Yeah, so, um, I, you know, I had mentioned before that, uh, I tried to distract myself after the mm -hmm. accident by making jokes. Well, my uh, humor is so much my mode of distraction and defense that I was literally making jokes after I'd been hit by the truck. And when I was lying, I had been carrying dry cleaning. The truck hit me and, and the truck i'm underneath the truck and i can feel the engine blowing hot air on me and there's a bag of dry cleaning on my face and of course i can't move it my hands are pinned and i i and it was very scary because i couldn't breathe the plastic was in my mouth but when i realized you know that i was about to stop breathing you know i i felt like i was going to drown i did think to myself well you know he just got hit by a truck, but you're going to die suffocating under dry clothes. Like, I just had to go, you know, somewhere to find mm -hmm. some lightness. Um, but uh, so uh, just within seconds, somebody pulled plastic out. I could breathe. And that was a one. I was flooded with love and, and gratitude. Um, and then once the truck was pulled off me and I had EMTs around me, it was a strange sensation because I don't know if I felt pain. I was mm -hmm. totally in shock, but I knew what it must be like, what it must feel like to be hit by a truck. We can all kind of imagine. We don't want to. I mean, it's horrible. But we have an idea of what it feels like to hit your head like that. So I knew it must hurt. I knew I must have a huge wound but he didn't actually feel it. I was so um, buzzing with electricity. I was just vibrating totally. So I think that must have been shock protecting me from the pain, which eventually I felt the pain once I got to the hospital, but uh, it took a while for the shock to wear off, I think. I really enjoyed how you brought in, Amy, how I will never say that I feel like I've been hit by a truck when I'm tired. <laughs> I, I made a lot of promises once the dry cleaning was out of my mouth and the, the uh, truck was off me and I could see trees and sky. I made lots of promises. I can't say I, I kept them all, but I've kept that one. I kept that one. Um, oh, not, maybe I'll mention something else that uh, might be interesting to viewers. The EMTs, you know, I was very fortunate. They were right there. And there were men on one side of me and they were all talking in complicated terms. And I absolutely didn't want to hear what they were saying. But there, I didn't know who this was. Later, I found out she was just a stranger, passerby. It's this woman with this Irish lilt. And as soon as she started speaking to me, I totally calmed down. I, I, they wanted me to move my head. I refused. You know, she asked me to, I would do it. And later on, when I was having my somatic, uh, you know, therapies to deal with trauma, mm -hmm. I couldn't move to my left, but I could move to my right. And I realized that's because the fear was with the EMTs and the safety was with the Irish. Mm -hmm. So, that had already been incorporated in my nervous system. So, um, and you know, I tried to find her, put an ad, a little notice in the paper, asked everyone I knew, but I know she existed, she was there, but 
I, I could never find her to thank her. She was there in your moment of need. Absolutely. I, I refer to her as the Irish angel because she was amazing. <laughs> Let's dive into that a little bit, Amy, of after your accident, you amazingly walked home, left the hospital that day, but that doesn't mean that you had recovered as there was a lot of healing after that incident that you walked through with therapy and trauma mm -hmm. that had opened up in a completely different capacity. Can you talk to us about that? Sure. I, um, so, you know, the accident happened, and this is out in East Hampton, eastern end of Long Island, and I was taken by ambulance to our tiny airport and helicoptered to Stony Brook to a, where all, well, they always say where the head traumas go. So I must have arrived there about four o'clock, and at two in the morning, they said to me, and I won't go through all the whatever, everything that was happening in the hospital, but at two in the morning, they said, if you can walk, you can go home. It's like a walk. So I got out of bed. I honestly, I took like three little pathetic steps holding on. And they said, turn around. I took three more. And they said, okay, you can go home. I, I was more shocked that they were sending me home than I got hit by the truck. And oh my gosh, driving home, it was, you know, my world had changed. All the things you take for granted that basically cars stay in their own lanes, that your car stays in your own lane, that um, you, you won't get, you won't just automatically be thrown out of your car or something. I was, I could take, all of those things I took for granted were gone. I, I just, as we were kind of speeding along, I just thought, God, you know, get me home. And lying in bed that night, I just, I think I have a line in the book you know, I was I was looking around at all the familiar things in my bedroom, known for 20 years, and yet I was a stranger. I just didn't recognize myself. Um, and so I do want to say that it took a while. Um, I had a lot of physical therapy. I saw a wonderful osteopath, and I was having shoulder spasms and headaches and dizziness. But I was mainly seeing um, doctors, and they also said, you know, please see your therapist to forestall getting symptoms of PTSD, which I did, but I kept cracking jokes, you know, didn't really talk about it with her. Um, and just by chance, my osteopath was going to be out of town, and I had a spasm, and he said, go to my acupuncturist. She's a little outside the box, but she's great. I don't care how outside the box is. I just want the pain to end. Mm -hmm. I went to see her. She was lovely. We had all these connections, you know, more serendipity. And she started training in trauma release. And so I'm not sure I would have done that work had I not by chance ended up in her office. And to be clear, you know, with people listening, it's not like this happens overnight. Mm -hmm a session and oh my god I figured it out you know this was years a couple um and it's gradual and it's subtle but I just found this space opening up inside me that just hadn't been there and gradually as that space opened I experienced distance from the anxiety from trauma from the trauma of the truck and I think in that distance, I was safe enough on some level to revisit my father's situation. None of this being conscious, if you know, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm back trying to think you know, what did, what were the mechanics here? And yes. yeah. I really appreciate, Amy, how you bring in that healing is not an overnight thing, it is a process. And even when you feel like you have figured it out, there's always more, <laughs> uh, always more to learn. Absolutely. And, and I really, uh, you know, I'd had a lot of therapy. I could analyze myself, explain myself, talk about my parents without skipping a beat. I just thought I'd been in touch with every possible emotion. 
in truth, I felt there was part of me that was constrained. Mm. But I, I, my life was good, you know, I had a good marriage, children, job, you know, things were basically fine. And I highly recommend psychotherapy did so much for me. But it was the work on my nervous system that finally got to that residue of trauma in my system. And as you say, it's a process and I'm, I'm so grateful that I was kind of forced in a way to keep going with it because there was so much more to do and I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. You talk about trap doors in mm -hmm. your book. What do they mean to you? Well, I remember writing that it's in the prologue and I wrote the funny but writers will say this I wrote the prologue fairly late in the process and I was really trying to get in touch with what did the fear feel like as a child you know how could I I knew what it felt like but how could I put it in words so a reader could just understand that constant vigilance the constant fear when you um don't know what you're afraid of. You don't know what the problem mm -hmm. is. You just know something's terribly, terribly wrong and it could happen at any point. And so for me, I, I came up with this sort of metaphor of trap door, the idea you can't really see them, but something, you know, one could open up and your father could disappear into a hospital or your mother into a bottle or maybe your siblings, maybe you. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really that, that invisible that anxiety and fear with an invisible source of it because I didn't really know what was happening. Mm -hmm. I loved that metaphor as we all have our own trap doors to examine and look at. Yes. Yes. I think mm -hmm. I'm sure we all do. And um, I really, and I do also want to say, you write a, I write a book like this and, you know, there is hope throughout the book and it, you know, it, it's uplifting in the end. And I'm so grateful for the process, but it is gradual. It's, it's not like you do all this work and then you get to the end and it's done. I have no more work. I'll probably be working on this the rest of my life, but I just have so much more understanding, distance, and I've experienced so much more release that it just is easier. It's less fraught. And I think that's what we all want, just so that it's just that much less fraught for us. Mm -hmm. How did you feel when you went to go find out information about your dad at the library that day? Oh, thank you for asking that. Uh, well, that chapter is called Panic at the New York Public because um, I'd had a few uh, missteps. I'd had a few visits, but I had the wrong date. And frankly, oh, I'll just digress for a minute. In, in trauma work, they titrate. You know, you just you go into the discomfort, but not too long to re-trigger. And then you go to an area of comfort. I feel like I did that in my research. I had the date wrong twice. So I dipped into the New York public, couldn't find it. Well, anyway, the third time I had the date and I was scrolling with a, with a microfilm, you know, that noise it makes like baseball cards on bicycle spokes and, you know, things were just speeding by. And then I see this kind of white figure in a black void, different from anything. I thought, oh, what was that? And I went back and it was my father on the ledge and you could see the priest in the window and the the collar you know visible the little white collar and i i was on i was on the verge of a panic attack all of a sudden mm -hmm. i felt like i could hear sirens in the room i was buzzing like i'd been in the accident like limbs everything was buzzing i I had this feeling like my father was going to come back, that either he would be angry with me for finding it or that I had unearthed such a sort of a deep, dark secret because no one had the newspaper in our family. Mm. That maybe the trap door would open for me, you know, and I was going to disappear. So 
finally, I mean, it was probably 30 seconds or two minutes. Finally, I just, you know, my eyes were closed. I just tried to bring myself back into the room and deep breathe. But I could, I honestly couldn't look at those photographs. This is going to sound really absurd. I could glimpse them, but I couldn't sit with them probably without huge physical response for about a year. Mm -hmm. um, and then it really took quite a long time. Then I finally could. And then what I really did research, you know, got into internet archives, I found that those photographs were in newspapers across the country, 80 newspapers from the <laughs> tiniest towns to the, um, you know, to LA, to New York Daily News, to Chicago. So long answer to say, uh, I, I had a panic attack, I, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'll just say one thing. And I think because, although I talked about it so much in therapy, thought I understood it, I had really only thought about it in terms of me and my experience and how it affected mm -hmm. me. And here I was actually seeing my father and what could have happened. And it was a shock of recognition. Oh my God, you know, what was he thinking standing there? Mm -hmm. um, while you're talking about that, because I'm thinking about, you know, the way that you're seeing your perspective and looking at the articles now as an adult mm. but versus a child seeing things. What did you think in that moment when things were happening with your dad? What did you think was going on? Um, well, uh, early on, I remember, you know, my mother, I was four and a half and going on five. And my mother was always talking about, I'd hear hospital. So I told myself in the beginning that he was learning to become a doctor. But mm -hmm. then, you know, I didn't really hear anything about school. And then I thought, well, that's not working. <laughs> and then, then I thought maybe he was having a knee operation because I remember he once pushed me off his knee. I'd probably kicked him or something. But that was probably in the very beginning. And then when it dragged on and he wasn't coming home and we started to get beautiful handwritten notes from him, I just, I didn't know other than that he was away and that he was sick. And then when he um, came back, I made constant warnings about uh, do not you know, get your father upset, don't get him angry, don't bother dad, he can't handle it. I just thought that something was terribly wrong with him. And although I knew nothing about the suicide, I have to say, I felt like if I made a mistake, if I got him upset, it could have life or death consequences. It felt that serious. So, you know, as a parent, I, I wonder about things that maybe I didn't tell my children that I should have. And children just know. I, On some level, you don't have the facts, but know the feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, yeah, so that was the feeling that you couldn't make any mistakes, you couldn't get my father upset that something terrible would happen. It's probably yeah. on four year old's terms, five year old's terms, something really bad. How have you changed the cycle within your own life for you and your family? Oh, well, I hope I have. But don't uh, let me not present myself as some model parent who learned from mine and then became perfect. You know, I struggled, as I talked about, with my own anxiety. So I had anxiety around my children. And I was always so afraid of transmitting anxiety, uh, of transmitting the feelings. I didn't want them to have the kind of experience I had, but I'm sure um, I couldn't help it because you know, I, I was a fairly anxious parent, although our house was much more open and happy and my husband's a wonderful man and very stable and all of that. But I'll tell um, 
my younger son, uh, at one point, I think I was anxious. He wasn't doing his homework or something. I was probably overreacting and projecting. What does this mean for his future? And I was doing something. And he just <laughs> and he goes, Mom, you've got to do something about your anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. You know, he's about 14. <laughs> Couldn't, you know, I couldn't say, but Peter, you know, you have homework. I just looked at him. I was like, I don't think I said it, but I said to myself, you're absolutely right. Let it go. Um, so I tried to recognize my own anxiety and be more open. And I will say that uh, with this same son, you know, he read my memoir in the PDF early on. And I, he had a wonderful response to it. And uh, that to me just felt like intergenerational healing mm -hmm. that, the results that I'd had had, or hopefully he, he understood in context and understood my background and, and the impact of my upbringing on me. And I think it helped him look at how these things manifested in his life. And so, I'm really grateful for that. And I, I will just add too that beyond my own, you know, my children and, and of course my husband's so supportive. That's been wonderful. But my sister, sort of my book was bookended by grief because the impetus to write it started really in terms of my brother's death. My sister read it right before it was published. And she was my biggest cheerleader. Uh, she was so supportive. It was really beautiful. And it healed certain aspects of our relationship. And then she died six months later, unexpectedly. And so it brought, you know, a, a healing to that relationship. It was such a gift to me. So I, I do feel for anyone out there who's you know, writing memoir, uh, or about their family, and even about grief or any heavy top heavy topics. There are a lot of gifts. There's there are gifts in there. It's not easy, and I'm not minimizing anything. But there are gifts, and um, I've been grateful to, to receive receive mm -hmm. that. Have you found as you were writing your memoir and asking those questions about yourself? And your family and trauma was there a good amount of release and healing that came through diving into that too for you well you know i honestly feel like the um healing through the trauma work and all of that the therapy allowed me to do the writing so i that i wouldn't have been able to do the writing if i hadn't been almost all the way there in terms of the healing. But there were parts of the memoir that were harder to write than, than other parts. Excuse me. And those, I think, uh, led to healing because I gained more understanding as I was writing it. I would have to go back into my body, re-experience it, put myself back there. So a healing and a deeper understanding of myself as yeah. well as my parents. We're going to turn it to the inner child question oh. segment. Here we go, Amy. <laughs> First question, as a kid, what was one of the things you wanted more than anything? Oh, what did I want more than anything? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a really good question going to take a minute. What did I want? You know, I really think as a young child, I wanted to be with my father and have him be in his warm and playful and loving mood. Um, I love that. I love nursery school. I and I and maybe and I loved being read to, which is probably connected to my father. Love that more than anything. 
that quiet connection. Mm -hmm. Second question. What teacher or adult figure inspired you as a teenager? Ah, okay. So um, as a teenager, my English teacher, my 11th grade English teacher, she arrived at school as Miss Kern and became Mrs. Ridner. And she's since remarried. <laughs> um, she had, was basically just out of mat getting her master. She was young. She was so smart. And, you know, she taught, she was the English teacher. She had such high standards about writing and analysis. And she was the epitome of cool. I mean, this was 1969. And, uh, she was very cool. And I just wanted to become a better writer. I still have a paper I wrote in 11th grade with her red uh, markings in the margin going, <laughs> <laughs> Amy, these run-ons are inexcusable. <laughs> but actually, and so Patsy, you know, I called her later, came to my brother's memorial. I hadn't invited her. I hadn't seen her in 40 years. A, a high school friend had told her. And so that was the thank you note I was writing that was the inception of this memoir. So she inspired me in 11th grade and then had a lot to do unbeknownst to her 40 years later in me writing this book. I love that so much. Teachers are amazing and more inspirational than I think they understand for our generation. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. I've had some wonderful ones. Third question, Amy. Okay. What is the oddest food combo that you've liked and tried or you've just tried? Oh gosh. You know, um, I guess a lot of people, I don't know if this is odd, but I remember my good friend in high school always had pretzels in her ice cream. I, I'd never seen that before. So I had some of, I tried that, but didn't like it very much. That might've been the oddest, <laughs> but my favorite food, which I, I was a teacher too. And my seventh grade students used to just roll their eyes. Um, cottage cheese and frozen peas. <laughs> I could live on that the rest of my life. Really? Now, maybe because it rhymes. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know why. So I guess, is that odd enough? I have definitely never tried the cottage cheese and frozen peas. I'm just trying to get the consistency feel of like, was it like a I'm getting like this cloud effect visual of like a spoonful of just because the peas are still frozen, so they're bunched. Oh, <laughs> cook them. oh sorry. No, <laughs> cooked. <laughs> cooked frozen peas. I'm not that odd. <laughs> I was like, maybe it melts in your mouth and it's like a whole like texture type experience. So I just wanted people to know I wouldn't be shelling peas. That's not <laughs> I don't have the patience. I cook them though. <laughs> and I for anyone who's watching and would like to try either version of the cottage cheese and peas, let us know. We'd love to hear. <laughs> Maybe it's better actually frozen. <laughs> like a popsicle, a cottage cheese pea. Yeah. Little concoction. I like it. <laughs> Before we end today, what advice can you give our listeners and viewers on living a creatively abundant life? Well, um, I think, that, well, a number of things, but maybe the first one is silence your internal critic. Just whatever the impulse, whether you know, you're painting or writing or poetry or whatever, just uh, try to allow yourself to do it. And when that voice comes in, criticizing it's not as good as, you know, so-and-so, just tell yourself, you know, revision is my friend. And I'll get to that later. Just let me get it down. I, I really think, so that you start. I think so many people, and I, a perfect example, that's their life's desire, but they can't start because they're feeling like it won't be good enough. So I would say silence your internal critic um, and follow your creative impulses. If you have a little impulse, 
doodling on a pad, just do it. You don't know where it's going to lead. That and my father always said, you know, dig deep. Um, and I think that too, you know, just trying to continue to do the work because there's so much to be gained. And um, I hope everyone can find their, let their creative impulses, you know, bubble up to the surface. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's been a pleasure chatting with you about On the Ledge. Oh, it's been so much fun for me. You've asked such thought-provoking questions. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Where can our listeners and viewers find you if they have any questions after the show and would like to find your book? Sure. Uh, AmyTurnerAuthor.com is my website. And on the contact page, you, you know, shoot me an email. And uh, there's also, if you want to purchase my book, there's options there. And there are resources about books that go into detail about trauma work and um, some more information about the book. And I'm happy to, you know, I love to hear from people. So happy to uh, respond. Congratulations, Amy, with On the Ledge. And thank you so much for all of those who have joined us and will join us on the replay. Remember, as you go about the rest of your week to find the things that are working for you. And remember, you are the writer of your own story. What are you going to choose to do next? Have a beautiful rest of your day, everyone. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. It's been a delight.